Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Teaching and Learning Accessible Practices and Support panel. Um, and this is, of course, uh, an, another initiative within the Celebrate Learning Week. Um, today, we will be discussing accessibility and inclusivity um, in teaching and learning. Um, and um, I'm, um, I just want to say that uh, as a differently able professor, this is um, a panel that's very close to my heart. Uh, my name is Peter or Piotr Ahmad. I'm a teaching professor in the Department of History and Sociology uh, at UBC Okanagan. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and host this panel. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and the sharing um, of practices um, and um, experiences in inclusive uh, teaching and learning. Um, so again, um, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, before we start, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm hosting this session as an uninvited white settler uh, on the traditional and ceded ancestral territories of the Silk Okanagan Nation uh, here on the campus of UBC Okanagan in Kelowna. Um, and I would also like to respectfully acknowledge um, traditional ancestral rights of indigenous peoples wherever you are joining us from today. Um, before uh, we um, continue, I also wanted to um, share a few housekeeping notes and a little community agreement um, just to make sure that our session is a welcoming and respectful space. Um, so the first thing to note is, as Rachel said earlier, uh, this meeting is being recorded, um, although we will not be recording uh, the chat comments, um, just so you know. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. Um, we will also be sharing this video on the Celebrate Learning uh, Wiki resources page. So again, something to note. Um, this event will also have closed captions and you can see them by clicking on the CC button in your meeting controls. Um, finally, we will also have CTLT members, Rachel and Suki, who are available to help with any technical difficulties. Um, if, if there is anything, please contact Suki or Rachel uh, via our chat. Um, so that's it for housekeeping. Uh, in terms of our community agreement, I just wanted to share a few points um, that I have just so that we can make sure that our meeting today goes smoothly. So just a few points that I've prepared for that purpose. Um, the first one um, is that we acknowledge that we are all here to learn and we recognize that uh, our words and actions can have an impact on others. Um, the second, that we are all committed to making this session a respectful and welcoming environment for all. And finally, that we acknowledge that discussions around accessibility and inclusion can be uncomfortable at times and we are open to embracing that discomfort and learning from it. So, all that, of course, with the goal of making sure that we can learn in a respectful and welcoming atmosphere today. So now it gives me great pleasure to briefly introduce our panelists for today. Um, just so you know, I will be introducing our panelists um, in more detail before each presentation, but now I just wanted to very briefly mention who we have presenting. So today we have presenting um, the following panelists. We have first Laura Balk, uh, Accessibility Advisor, UBC Vancouver Center for Accessibility. Then we have Strang Burton, Associate Professor of Teaching in UBC Linguistics, um, followed by Ayaka Yoshimizu, Assistant Professor of Teaching in the Department of Asian Studies, and Tamara Ebel, Lecturer in the Faculty of management. Um, so our first presenter, um, Laura Bulk, um, if you'll allow me to introduce our first panelist. 
Um, and I just wanted to say that I am introducing the panelists as they themselves wanted to be introduced. And this is something that is really important for me, uh, particularly in the context of our panel, um, that um, I'm centering our presenters as they themselves want to be uh, presented. So uh, Dr. Belk is a blind scholar, friend, learner, woman, teacher, mentor, daughter, mentee, disabled person, occupational therapist, artist, and activist. She works at the Center for Accessibility with Students in Health Programs and teaches modules in the Master of Occupation, Occupational Therapy Program. She is also a board member of the Coalition for Disability Access in Health Science Education. Um, Laura, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start screen sharing once you have had a chance to stop screen sharing. Uh, that would be great. Um, so thank you all for um, joining us today. I'm going to set a timer so that I stay within the time because I'm really eager to have a conversation with you all. All right, so on your screen, um, you uh, might see uh, an image of myself. I'm a white woman. Um, I'm standing in a room. There's um, some light behind me. So you might see um, my hand kind of moving in front of the light over there. Um, and uh, I have short ish brown hair. I'm wearing an orange sweater. Um, and yes, the screen is blurred intentionally. Um, this in some way resembles uh, the way that I move through the world um, and, and speaks a little bit to uh, my perspective on uh, disability as being a, um, a different way of being in the world as part of our human diversity. So as we start, um, I'd uh, like to um, raise my hands to you all and say hi in, in the language of Musqueam people, say thank you um, for being here and also um, honor uh, the people who have contributed to me being here, um, including my parents and my ancestors, as well as uh, the mentors and mentors who've uh, been part of my journey and, and who still are. As we start, I'm going to invite you to participate uh, because that's what I do. Um, I really enjoy the participation. I'm putting in the chat a link so that you can participate in the Google, um, a Google form. You can also participate just by posting in the chat. I wonder if you could complete the sentence. I know I belong when. Take a moment to think about how does that sentence finish for you? So this question is one that I've asked in a lot of spaces and places um, with a lot of folks. Um, and uh, you folks are participating. Um, <laughs> you know you belong when you can participate. Um, when you find others who share the values that you share, uh, when you feel calm, when you're with your dog um, and that more and more are coming in. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to share um, some audio right now um, of some more folks who've shared about when they know that they belong. I know I belong when I have something to contribute and people recognize that. I know I belong when I can just be part of the rest of the group without feeling that sense of isolation. When people are happy to see me and they actually want to see all of me, not just the part that they are comfortable with. I know I belong in a classroom where we practice inclusive design. So it's not singling me out. When people do little inclusive things around me, like telling me that there's a wet paint sign, those little things that let me know they're thinking about me and including me. When I don't feel that I'm a burden 
when I feel like my needs and my boundaries are respected. When I'm invited to similar tasks as my colleague, but with the flexibility that maybe my copy of registration list is printed off of large print, for example, when they don't skirt around whether or not I can contribute. I know I belong when I feel connected to the other people around me and I get the sense that they're connected to me. I know I belong when people are curious about my life and they allow me to be myself without judgment. I know I belong when I get invited to join in. All right. So this question, I, in my framing of access and accessibility, this question of when do you know that you belong is very foundational. Uh, throughout this week, Celebrate Learning Week, you are getting all kinds of tips and tricks and ideas about how to make classrooms and spaces at UBC more welcoming, um, how to make them more accessible. And those are really important uh, strategies. And for me, belonging underlies this idea of, do we really have access? Are we really included? And so I just wanted to foreground this conversation uh, with that foundation. Um, upon a foundation of belonging, we can then build um, and we can build those learning spaces. And you're gonna hear from other panelists about some very creative and beautiful strategies for belonging. Something I also wanna emphasize is that accessibility and belonging, it's not just about disability. Uh, throughout this week, you will hear that again. And today you'll hear that again, that access is not just about disabled folks, folks with disabilities, people who are neurodiverse or who live with chronic physical or mental health conditions. Um, belonging and access is about all of us. When I think about access and access needs. Uh, I often, when I'm in person, uh, will use a strategy whereby I invite folks to um, introduce themselves. And as part of that, they introduce um, their, their names and pronouns and uh, where what their relations with the land are and if their access needs are being met. Often someone will say, oh, um, you know, they'll say the other intro pieces and then say, I don't have any access needs which is a great opportunity for all of us to learn when I then hand out pieces of paper and turn out all the lights and then ask people to read or to navigate the room or to pour a glass of water. And this really highlights that their access needs are no longer being met. And some folks' access needs are more a part of the default, um, such as having lights on in a room. So I encourage you to keep that in mind as well as you move through the rest of Learning Week and the rest of this panel to think about how can, how can you think of access more broadly. One of the things that I've learned in my work is also that this idea of cross-movement solidarity is really key, is really important to creating a, a UBC and a culture uh, where we can find a sense of belonging and build a sense of belonging together. We've really noticed throughout time and especially perhaps uh, throughout the pandemic years that having movements in uh, solid or in silos is not helpful. We really need to acknowledge that we are actually interdependent as, as communities. Um, we depend on one another. And my liberation depends on your liberation. And my belonging perhaps also depends on your belonging. Um, so this idea that we are interconnected so this is all very theoretical, don't worry. There are some tips and strategies coming from our panelists. And I think in the conversation that we have, we can also um, talk about some more of those. You heard one of them in, in one of the participants who shared in that recording um, around a wet paint sign. Uh, another great example is just saying your name when you pass someone in the hallway or perhaps when you're around a table not assuming that everyone sees you in the same way, or perhaps not assuming that everyone hears you or can read at the same speed. Um, so thinking about some of those assumptions, these can be 
small but very significant gestures of belonging uh, when we reach out in that way. When we share our pronouns, when we invite others to do the same, when we talk about our relations with the land and so on and so forth, these are gestures of belonging and of hospitality that we can enact in our classroom spaces. So with that said, I am going to pass it on uh, back to Peter and uh, the next panelist. And I look forward to having a conversation with all of you um, as, we, as we finish up with the panelists. Next up, we have Strang Burton, um, as of today, as I've heard, Associate Professor of Teaching in the Linguistics Department. Um, Strang teaches a large introductory course, Languages of the World, that looks at a widely diverse group of languages, as well as an introductory level course on how to learn a language. He is not First Nations, but he's also a long-term employee of the Stolo Nation, where he has worked for many years as part of community-run projects to revitalize the Halkemelon language. And I hope um, I got that uh, right there. Thank you so much, Strang. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few um, practical things um, for trying to make people feel um, welcome and included in uh, my classes. The first one I'm going to talk about is um, Inclusiveness in naming, uh, using names in the um, in in problem sets and uh, exam questions and examples and so on, and it relates to the idea that you want your students to feel that the material is relevant to their lives. So uh, some examples. Until I started thinking about this, it would be common for me if I was making up a, an exam question, a multiple choice question. Um, I say, so Fred is learning Mandarin and he learns four word families each week, or I say, suppose there's two children called Mary and Sue and they're of equal intelligence. What I wanted to do, I realized at a certain point that yeah, I'm missing the cultures of probably more than half of my classes. So I found some resources where I could um, get names from other languages and cultures. And so, for example, now I would say uh, Juma is learning Mandarin and he learns four word families each week. Juma is an Arabic name. I'm hope I'm saying it right. Um, it's also used in Swahili and Pashto, or I say, uh, suppose two children called them Mary and Che Young uh, using a Korean name. Um, in order to find names from different languages and different cultures, I'm going to just let, point you to this site behind the name.com. It's a, it's a site um, about the history of names and um, from a lot of different cultures. And it has a function where you can look up names from different cultures and you can know if it's uh, used traditionally for males or for females. Um, so that's um, one aspect of um, uh, how I try and, just avoid using just all Anglo-Saxon names so that I'm missing the cultures of many of my students. A similar um, uh, a related uh, tip I have, something that I started doing in, in my classes. So in the, in the examples of sentences, um, is this classic example when we teach linguistics, we teach, do these tree diagrams and we'd say John loves Mary and that's, we always use this example. At a certain point one day I just started saying, well, sometimes John loves Bill. So we would have um, uh, uh, same sex uh, couples represented in the examples um, rather than just um, uh, heterosexual couples. And one of my students actually wrote to me and he said he, he really appreciated that. It made him uh, really feel much more uh, welcome in the classroom. <laughs> Another thing, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going through a series of practical things where I try and um, make the materials uh, more welcoming and accessible. A practical thing I'd like to talk about is uh, colorblind students. So a couple of years, somebody asked me, do you, do, is your materials accessible to colorblind students? And I hadn't really thought about it. So I'm not an expert on colorblindness at all, but I, I looked stuff up and tried to figure out uh, what do slides look like to colorblind students. And I found you can get these simulators that show you what it looks like and what kind of problems can it 
create if you're re relying on certain color contrasts and then just some quick tips on those to share with you what I found. So um, if I understand correctly, and again, I'm not an expert on color blindness, there's uh, three main kinds. The most common one is a, a called green color blindness, sometimes also called red green color blindness because it affects the both red and green. It's actually quite a lot of people have it. 6% um, of males, 1% um, have it uh, a lot and 5% uh, have it uh, to a certain degree. Um, and then less than 1% of females, but still quite a lot of people. So that means I'm getting myself, I have a lot of students. So I'm getting like quite a lot of students who have this issue. And uh, I ran it through the simulator. You can see what it looks like. So on the first box, this is a slide I had about the languages of India. And there's two different groups of languages in India. One is Indo-European related to the languages of Europe and some other regions. And then another unrelated group and different language family, Dravidian. And I had color coded them with the Indo-European ones in red and the uh, other family in green to separate them. And then when I ran it through the simulator, I could see, if you see in the middle column here, 1% um, of males who have severe red-green color blindness, that's like 100 people for me in a year, um, have, um, it just looks really almost exactly the same. And 5% uh, who have it less extremely, it's not as, it's, they can probably see the contrast, but it's not a very strong contrast. Um, so the second type, the other two types are much rarer, uh, but they're still going to hit some of my students. So uh, blue, yellow color blindness, it's a, a less than 1% of people, and it's usually not genetic. I think it's usually um, acquired through injury or other problems, uh, but these people are blind to the color blue, or and again, there's different levels of it. So when I run this through the simulator, Again, if I do the same thing with the languages of India, but I had coded uh, blue versus green, then I run it through the simulator. You see the people who have it very strongly in the middle column. It's kind of a contrast, but it's not as strong as you would like. Uh, the third type of colorblindness, to be completely colorblind, it's actually very, that's actually very rare, uh, but some people do have it, and if you run it through the simulator, uh, everything looks sort of a shade of gray for the people who have it strongly. So all of that, putting that all together, um, I resolved after realizing and seeing what it looked like to actually for the for the for the uh, red green one quite a number of people, I resolved to never just rely on color coding in my in my information. So just it's always got to be if you're going to use color coding, it's always got to be something else. So you can add symbols, different textures, different uh, fonts, and so on. And if you're thinking about color combinations, the main things to be concerned about is trying to contrast anything with green and also uh, blue versus purple gray. And I have uh, some links to some resources on these tips here. This is where I found most of this information. Designers, a lot of these are designer sites. Of course, designers are very aware of these issues. The uh, last uh, really practical uh, little thing I'd like to talk about, I it, over the last few years, um, I don't uh, uh, sign ASL, um, um, but I started working with some members of the ASL community who are developing courses here at UBC and ASL, uh, credit courses in ASL. And I'm just, uh, I can't talk about the accessibility issues from the point of view of somebody from the deaf community, but I'll talk about a little bit uh, from the perspective of connecting with people from that community as a non-signing person. And it's really just quite, just a couple of little things I'm gonna say. One is um, if you want to invite somebody from the deaf community to one of your meetings or one of your classes, you'll need to book a professional interpreter. The interpreter has to come into the class and um, uh, the, 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 the person from the deaf community will be signing and they'll, and they'll um, go back and forth for you. UBC uh, will support this. Uh, you don't have to, we don't have to pay as individual faculty for it if they're coming to a class or a professional event. It's a little bit hard to find the booking information. So I put the link here and then you can just book it and then uh, you'll get the uh, interpreter will come into the class. You need quite a bit of lead time. Like once I tried to do it like on a Monday for a Friday and they were like, no way, you need like a few weeks because these people are busy. I have um, just one um, intercultural tip for communication with members from the deaf community. When I first started working with people from the deaf community, I asked people uh, who had worked with the community for a tip. And, and the tip that always comes up is 
So you'll be sitting in the room with the person from the deaf community who you're actually having the conversation with and with the interpreter who is speaking the language out loud in the modality that you can understand um, and then signing with the, with the other person. And it's easy for your eye gaze to go over to the person, to the interpreter, because that's the person whose voice you're hearing. But actually you have to remember that your conversation is with, with, the, with the person from the deaf community. And you have to, even though I can't understand what the signs I have to I have to direct my attention towards them. The interpreter, it's actually better to have the interpreter behind you uh, so you don't even see them and you just hear their voice. Okay. Um, and if uh, for the other uh, perspective, um, Nigel Howard is the is the uh, instructor uh, uh, that I've been working with uh, from the deaf community. And he had a recent UBC news article about this. So if you're interested in the topic, I have a link to it there. Okay. So those are my uh, little practical tips about uh, some ways I'm trying to make my classes uh, more accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Strang. Thanks a lot. Uh, looking forward to the Q&A. Um, and uh, next up, we have Ayaka Yoshimizu, an assistant professor of teaching, Asian Studies Department, UBC Vancouver. Um, so um, this is uh, how Ayaka introduces herself. Um, Ayaka coordinates and teaches arts courses for the UBC Ritsumeikan Academic Exchange programs. She also teaches Japanese literature, films, media, and audiovisual translation in Asian studies and Canadian and Trans-Pacific studies in the UBC RITS programs. Her pedagogical projects are centered around decolonizing teaching and learning, promoting anti-racist approaches and social justice broadly in and beyond the classroom. Ayaka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, the introduction, Peter. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the stolen lands of the Ma. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I live on their land as an invite, uninvited guest, and I am a non-disabled person. I am middle-aged cis woman from Japan, and I speak English as my additional language. Um, I have medium short hair and I'm wearing mustard colored long sleeve shirt today. Um, I have been working on developing a decolonial and anti-racist approach to research and teaching throughout my academic career. And I recently started to learn about accessible teaching and learning through the project I'm doing with my colleague, Shalin Oba and graduate students, including Corinne De Freitas and Shota Iwasaki, to develop resources for disabled instructors at UBC, um, including faculty, and also graduate student sessionals and TAs. And from this project, I learned that there are a number of disabled members of UBC who are doing excellent jobs, developing their teaching accessible, while also struggling with universities inaccessibility and complicated accommodation processes, and also developing ways to make their work more accessible to themselves. And so I'm learning so much from them. And in this learning process, I'm also finding a lot of resonance between accessible teaching and decolonial and anti-racist teaching. So to me, advancing accessibility in my own practice of teaching and learning go hand in hand with advancing decolonial and anti-racist approach. Um, so I have a few key words here, um, embodiment, multimodality, and multispatial temporality. Um, at the time, as the time is limited, I'll describe these as I go over my approach to teaching in more, more concrete terms. So um, generally speaking, I begin with the premise that university and academia have historically been and still are colonial and racist, uh, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, and ableist. So in order to make teaching and learning actually inclusive, we have to make these various forms of oppressions visible. So all my courses address various oppressions that exist in society. And whenever possible, I also try to address oppressions that exist around us in our everyday lives and in university and within the classroom and reflect on how each of us is implicated in those oppressive structures. And other things I have done over the years include um, diversify readings and audiovisual materials. So make sure various identities are reflected in the authors and creators of the course materials. So in my course, Japanese documentary media, for example, I consciously include documentaries directed by women and disabled filmmakers. 
And I have to be extra conscious about this choice because Japanese film industries and documentary scene have been extremely ableist and male dominant. Um, but this simple practice makes a lot of difference because it increases possibilities for students with different identities and experiences to find something more relatable and identifiable in the course. And that enhances their learning. Diversify assessment techniques. And initially I began doing this having international students who speak English as their additional language in mind. So give an option to work as a small group or implement peer interactions in some graded assignments as some students, depending on their cultural backgrounds, may excel in a collaborative work setting. Um, implement various modalities in course assessments. So this is what I mean by multimodality. Um, students who are not very strong in writing may do better in an oral presentation or an audiovisual output and other alternative ways to share knowledge. Diversify style of presentation. Um, so what is considered as good, quote unquote, academic writing has various problems. And in fact, the third person objective and systematic style has been critiqued by a number of feminist, racialized and indigenous scholars as male-centered, Eurocentric and colonial. Um, I address this problem by creating assignments where students can explore different modes of sharing knowledge, including personal and family or community narrative and creative expressions. And this is where I implement embodiment in assignments. So I ask students to link course materials, ideas and concepts to their personal family and community experience and share their stories with peers. And I find this viable and powerful way to enhance students' understanding of the course content and abilities to critique course materials. Uh, it produced similar effects as diversifying course materials, but even more powerful as they are actually directly linking the course to their own identity and experiences. Remove in-class, closed book, and timed assessments. So all my final exams are take-homes, take -homes, and students are given at least one week to submit their answers. Um, I find timed in-class exams um, ableist. Some students can be sick or going through some health-related issues on or around the exam dates, and university campus is not necessarily accessible in the first place. Many students live far from Point Grey campus in places that are a little bit more affordable. And some students need more time to read, think and write in English. Um, so for many reasons, I find uh, time then in class exams um, not very accessible. And my courses do not have any learning objectives related to speed of reading or writing or memorization. So it doesn't really make sense for me at least to assess their performance based on these skills provide the um, remote and asynchronous options. And we all have done this. So this is what I mean by um, multispatial temporality. Uh, learning does not have to always take, um, sorry, learning does not always have to happen right here and right now. It could happen in some other places and some other times. Um, within a set time frame, though, as institutionally, it's currently impossible to make it completely flexible. So uh, just quickly, I'm going to share one example uh, of assignment. And this is from my uh, actually proposed course called Indigeneity in Asia and Asian Diaspora. And this is a new course that, I, that just passed the department voting. And so I know I'm kind of cheating by sharing an assignment I'm yet to actually try out in my course, but this is a good example to share because it incorporates many of the elements I just discussed in my previous slide including embodied narrative, multimodality, and multispatial temporality. So the assignment asks students to reflect on their journey, individual or intergenerational, to the lands in which they study, work, and or live, and how they identify themselves in relationship to the lands, and the people, uh, indigenous peoples on the lands, and what it means to indigenize the way they learn and share knowledge. Um, I provide individual or group options. And in terms of the output format, students can choose between writing in the form of personal letter to somebody who is important to them, or if they choose a um, group option, talking circle format. And this could be in written or spoken form. Um, they still need to apply what they learn in the course. So in this case, indigenous methodology and relational accountability. But instead of demonstrating their understanding of this methodology in abstract terms, they need to just show it in practice. 
So I'm going to end my part here, but if you're interested, um, I'm facilitating another workshop during CTLT Spring Institute together with um, other members of my project team. And we'll have three panelists who have disabilities and they will talk about their experience and perspectives of uh, so-called return to campus, which happened this spring and what it means uh, in terms of accessibility. So my apologies for self-promotion, but I will share the legis legis legislation link in the chat. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm looking forward to the Q&A, of course. Um, and uh, next up, we have uh, Tamara Ebel, um, a lecturer in the Faculty of Management. Uh, with over 20 years of experience teaching in higher education, over a decade of which has been with UBC, uh, currently as lecturer in the Faculty of Management, uh, UBC Okanagan campus, Tamara has engaged with thousands of students and shared teaching philosophies and pedagogical approaches with many colleagues, both at UBC and beyond. A self-proclaimed non-expert in universal design for learning, Tamara looks forward to sharing key things um, experience has taught her in her aspiration to embrace uh, UDL. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you all for joining today, and thank you for CT to CTL and CTLT for um, having this really impactful panel. I, I hope to do justice to my section here, uh, but even for myself, I, I speak, I'm sure, not only on my behalf, but on others who have participated thus far in the session, uh, that the panelists before me have brought some wonderful ideas, many of which are great refreshers for me, some of which are new things for me to consider and I look forward to taking these forward. So I, I'm hopeful to be able to share with you some new ideas as well. What I'd like to do, and I will also try to put this in the chat for us, and hopefully this link will open for you. When you click on the link, it should hopefully take you to a Jamboard site. This is something that I became familiar with during COVID. I was at a session where somebody was using it and I thought this is interesting and I've used it for a handful of things since. What you'll be able to do when you see this, you should, I hope, see on your screen uh, a white space with a blue, big blue post-it sticky in the middle that says, what sparked your interest to attend today? And you'll note in the top, uh, top part of the, the screen, you'll see some animals coming through. The, your People are coming through as anonymous, which I, there are reasons for that I'll, I'll speak to in a minute. On the far left of your screen, you'll see a variety of options. And one of those options, which I feel like is sort of one of the safer ones or, or easier ones, uh, is the fourth one down. It looks like uh, a piece of paper or a post-it. If you click on that, it'll bring up a new sticky note that you can type on. And in that sticky note, you'll have the opportunity also to change colors. It will come up for me, it comes up as a default of yellow, but feel free to click green or blue or pink or thank you. So I see somebody has added a yellow post-it that says success. Yes, and you can also move your post-its around. Somebody has put me up and my esteemed colleague is presenting. And I will also take the liberty of moving some of these as well to try and improving the learning experience for all students. Accessibility is important. I am woefully ignorant and trying to change that I did not write that, but I would think that was me right there. I wanted to talk with people who are thinking about and valuing these things, caring about every student, to be a better instructor. I became a disabled instructor and made me reflect on others' needs, looking to improve my courses and anticipate what help my colleagues may need, enhancing my teaching practice. I am always looking for more ways to improve the inclusivity and accessibility of what I do. I want to learn various ways to improve students' experience from an inclusive and accessibility to meet people who are also interested in accessibility, understanding actionable tips to employ to create more accessible materials and practices. I hope I have captured all, but I, I certainly may have missed a few. If it was the case, my apologies, it was unintentional. But what I want to share with you if it will allow me to. The question was, what sparked your interest to attend the session today? And by having you access this and be able to provide your perspective, 
whether you participated or just observed, these are applications. This is an application of universal design for learning principles. I know that is not what this session is specifically, but I see great value in attributing the two. Uh, in, accessible, uh, in accessibility with universal design for learning, there are effective networks, the why of learning to create uh, using creative means of engagement. And I just, I, I won't go into detail on this. I, again, I'm a non-expert for sure, but in my learnings of what I've taken away from some sessions I've been at, the effective networks, the, the why of learning, it, we need to consider how learners get engaged and how they stay motivated, how they're challenged and excited or interested. And these are effective dimensions. So again, it, it's well beyond my, my pay scale to be able to describe any of this, the, the neuroscience behind it, but this is a summary and a slide that I have borrowed. Another component of engagement, it's the purpose for the effective networks is engagement, it's the purposeful, motivated learners. For them, we need to stimulate interest and we need to motivate for learning. So this is context for my thoughts that I'll share with you today. And what I want to share with you is not lessons in this because again, I'm, I'm learning and, and, and thank you so much to the, the person who's posted. I, I, I resonate with many of these, but particularly the post that says I'm woefully ignorant and trying to change that. That is so me. I, I, I even questioned whether I was the appropriate person to have on a panel for something like this because I'm learning too, but I'll share with you what experience has taught me six key takeaways. Uh, one relates to safe space, and, and this comes from UDL um, theories and, and, and principles as well. But some of the things that I focus on or try to focus on are a mutual respect and understanding environment. So uh, in the welcome, I try to create, intentionally create a safe space. I include in my course syllabus wording such as listening to each other, supporting each other, and treating each other with respect is a non-negotiable must. So I, I preface it up front, and I also am very clear about that in my first welcoming with students to remind them that this is an opportunity for everybody to learn. I also include, and I'll just share with you a little bit more from my syllabus, uh, some of the wording. Students are encouraged to interact openly with others, to support each other's learning experience with excellent listening skills, to question ideas in a respectful manner, and to respond rather than, rather than react to queries and feedback. Your commitment to providing interdependence of your colleagues and classmates to help create a supportive and constructive learning community will be appreciated. So I really try to set the tone up front I'm sure that I could do a better job at it, but I do notice that when you bring home the importance of this right up front setting context, it does tend to break the ice a little bit. I also am very clear when I am involved in any sort of synchronous sessions or online pieces or even potentially live pieces that I might record going forward that I, I've included in the syllabus, but I also remind students that, um, so this is my syllabus wording, please note that the instructor will record and post synchronous sessions out of respect for copyright and the privacy of participants. Students are strictly prohibited from editing, sharing, or selling such recordings. So I really wanna make that safe space and ask students to appreciate and respect that their, the images and or voices and opinions and perspectives that may be shared in the session are intended to be within our learning community, not turned into memes or something else. So I really highlight that up front. I try as much as possible with large classes, it's certainly more difficult. And definitely when we are in a virtual world, it's even more difficult, but I really do try to learn the names of my students, to learn the names of participants. This activity that I had you do, for instance, um, had I set it up where the people's names would show up or had it been a, a screen sharing or had, people been participating in the chat, I would have been very diligent about acknowledging those things by name, so-and-so said, or I see the comment from whoever it may be. I really try, and I acknowledge up front that I'm probably going to need help with pronouncing the names. We have a lot of international students in our programs, which is wonderful, but it is a challenge for some of us to get those names right. So I, I ask students and or colleagues, please correct me if I've not done a good job of this with your name. And, and they, they tend to be very welcoming with that. And I really try on most occasions, trying to use positive framing, 
So thank you in advance instead of you shall not do this, that, or the other. So um, trying to create that safe space. Another, uh, sorry, and I just want to share with you if you may be interested in the safe space pieces for UDL. I'll share this in the chat. Um, another piece that is important in, in my view is appreciating the value of perspective and in reinforcing to participants that their opinion, their perspective is important. We want to hear it. Everybody has a story, different perspectives bring learning for all of us. And I try to promote empathy throughout my classes. I try and remind people often of the two ears, one mouth um, adage. So you wanna listen with your ears, not with your mouth. So if somebody is speaking, give them the space to speak and think about what you may wanna ask them and leave space for that to have those conversations. Uh, but I do want everybody to feel heard. Uh, reinforcing and reframing ideas that we hear. If I've heard you correctly, or help me understand, or that's an interesting perspective, would you please elaborate on whatever it may be, tends to open up that safe space for students and, and give them a little bit more confidence to share their perspective. And again, embracing the imperfect. So I didn't have the, the setting quite right, and folks weren't able to actually access and see the edit mode in Jamboard. But I'm, I'm, as anybody else, prone to error. And I, I thank people for bringing that forward. And in my courses, I actually, I, I max it out uh, depending on the course, but it's typically 5% for the duration of the course maximum. But to acknowledge my, you know, so whoever may have been, and I, I would like to say Suki, but I would go back and double check if it was the actual case and say, Suki's just earned a 1% bonus <laughs> toward overall final grade, 5% max. But publishers make mistakes. There are mistakes sometimes on my slides. I might, you know, something I, I may think students have access to, they may not have access to. So for a student to tell me, to be the first student to tell me that mm, actually, and, and to tell me diplomatically, actually it's not working for us. It allows me to correct that and to bring that forward and to bring forward clarity if it was a typo or a misspeak for the benefit of the whole learning community. So I embrace the imperfect for myself as well. It makes me vulnerable, but it, allows the students the opportunity to feel comfortable, I hope, or more comfortable that it's a safe space that we can make errors and that's okay. Uh, a third lesson for me is optimizing relevance, value, and authenticity. Uh, at the start of the term, I ask students to share a discussion board post where they introduce themselves and I have a set list of questions and ask them, you know, what are your interests? Have you got, share a picture of your pet if you'd like, whatever it might be, so that they can connect with the learning community. Uh, I ask them to apply real life opportunities and, and scenarios. So from my course syllabus, participants are strongly encouraged to share real life experiences and considerations as they come to mind during discussion and analysis of relevant concepts. It's really important because they've got stories to tell and that helps in the learning. And then I try my best to encourage participation and imagination. So hands-on activities in, in my courses, but also I have something called creative delivery. I've moved away particularly for my fourth year courses, uh, for presentations for students, I've moved away from PowerPoint and I've asked students to do something more creative, a more creative learning experience to share with their peers where they present a message, not a topic. What's the message? What's the so what? And do it in a way that's creative that doesn't involve PowerPoint. Uh, also back to the learning community, I, I try throughout the term to, to get interaction between the students and in discussion board for those who are more comfortable there, perhaps in breakout sessions if they're comfortable or in a classroom environment. And I also have them do a team charter if it's teamwork. And I ask them to identify within their group, each person needs to identify at least one strength that they plan to bring to the team and at least one area of learning development that they'd like to work on. And then within that team, I ask them to find a coach and they have to sign a charter that actually indicates each student who's gonna coach who on, on what piece. And I find that students are actually really appreciative of that approach. And I'd like to just share with you another link. Uh, many of us have been trying for some time and some more successfully than others to flip our classroom. Obviously COVID required that for us, for many of us. But I also try to instill a growth mindset 
in students so that it's not about the result that the result is important yes it's about the aha moments and the learning and i call them the light bulb moments and i have students who have found in in zoom they found the little icon the little light bulb icon and students will actually put the little light bulb up so that i can then acknowledge and say you know whoever it is they've they've found a light bulb moment would you please share with us what was your light bulb moment in this learning and it really gets the conversation going i also have gone away from participation and i try to have students do self-assessments of their learning to which i then also contribute a piece as as part of their overall grade but one of the biggest takeaways one of the biggest things i'm learning about inclusivity is this and i've put uh, for the benefit of those who may not be able to see this as clearly, I've, I've got a slide here that has uh, one of the little minions from the movie. And it has the wording that says this, surround yourself with positive people, be a positive energy, spread your light and love. And to the extent we're able, when we are in sessions, when we are with students, when we are with colleagues, yawns are contagious, but so are smiles and so is positive energy and bringing that positive energy and those smiles and, and that vulnerability to the classroom, I believe in from what I've been experiencing brings a, a wealth of accessibility for students because they feel connected, they feel that they can connect their why and that they can walk away feeling good that they've learned something from aha moments. So um, I, I leave you with this I'm, I'm happy to share any additional links that i may have that i may not have have put into the chat so far but uh, i welcome any questions you may have during the q a and please if you um find value in any of these i'm, I'm happy if you reach out as well by email thank you so much thank you very much uh, tamara for a great presentation looking forward to the q a of course um so now we've heard from all of our presenters for today and i believe it is time for our Q&A session. So I would like to uh, invite all of you to um, further discussion of the presentations that uh, we have seen and heard today. Um, and our Q&A session will be led by our moderator, Rishma Chunidas. Um, thank you so much, Rishma, and over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richmond Chinidas. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Nursing. I use gender pronouns she, her. I'm joining from the ancestral and ceded territory of the Silk Sokanagan people. I have long black hair. I'm wearing a green long sleeve blouse. Thank you, panelists, for the great presentations. It is wonderful to hear about all of the accessible strategies that are being used. Um, I love all the resources that have been shared in the chat. Now I'd like to give the participants time to ask our panelists questions. But before I begin, I wanna remind everyone of the community agreement that Peter mentioned earlier. We are all here to learn from and with, with each other. We're responsible for equitable and respectful dialogue in the shared space. I ask that you listen to understand each other's perspectives and be mindful that you are accountable for the impact of your words. Feel free to raise your hand and turn on your microphone. If you choose to turn on your camera or leave. Um, having the courage to share your experiences and your perspectives on inclusive and accessible teaching. Um, thank you for all the questions. Um, it was an absolutely wonderful discussion in the chat and, and also on the audio. Um, so being mindful of the time, I just wanted to um, um, close with a, one or two remarks, um, one or two relevant remarks for the end of our session. So the first one is that there will be a feedback survey which will be emailed to all attendees at the end of the week. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the session will be recorded or the session recording, sorry, will be added to our Celebrate Learning Week resource wiki page. Um, and I also would like to encourage everyone to stay tuned for upcoming events, uh, upcoming Celebrate Learning events that we still are having on this week. I believe one of them is tomorrow. Yes, we have that on the chat. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate that. So definitely there is uh, lots more learning to happen this week. Um, and with that, I just wanted to thank you all 
everyone, uh, my co-hosts, uh, our moderator, um, the CTLT team who made the event possible and supported us throughout the event, um, and all of you here today who joined us, um, thank you for appreciating diversity, inclusivity in education through your presence. Uh, I hope it was a fruitful meeting for everyone. I hope that we have all learned, or I'm sure we have all learned something today. Um, and um, once again, a big thank you. Um, we are very happy. I was very happy to, to be able to join you today and host our wonderful meeting today. Thanks a lot.